Hello, everybody. I am Dylan Pescator, joined with my guys, Ian Nicholas and Austin Platt. And we are back here for Beyond the Whistle, Episode 2, where we will be talking about the series that just ended the World Series, the Nationals, taking it over the Astros in seven. We'll also touch on some NFL and NBA topics. But let's start off with the MLB crazy series, guys. The Nationals uh, road team won every single game. That's unheard of. It never happened until now in all the four major sports. Just an insane series with turnarounds from the Nationals being up 2-0 to the Astros being up 3-2 and the Nationals eventually winning it in that wonderful Game 7 that we saw. Ian, what was your official thoughts in the Game 7? You know, the Astros, they started up 2-0. Then uh, Rendon really kick-started that Nationals offense with the home run. We had um, Soto coming up big. And then, of course, Scherzer as the pitching for the Nationals. Well, this Nationals team, I think it's just one of the greater stories sports has seen in a while. I mean, you talk about a team that, you know, lost arguably one of its better players in Bryce Harper, you know, the most highest paid player in baseball. And they start 19-31, and and, you know, every person in the world would say this team is done. But that's why there's 162 games for a reason. It's still, you know, that's not even half the year. This team put it together. They have a lot of great players. A lot of them are going to hit the market. We're going to talk about that. And you can't count this team out. You know, it was a back-and-forth series, and, you know, even when they were down in Game 7, you still have to have a little faith in this team because this is what they've been doing all year long. Definitely. And Platt, just they go from here after losing a tough World Series. Yeah, a tough one, especially when many people thought the ALCS was really the World Series. Many people just doubted the Nationals the whole way. But now this Astros team, obviously Garrett Cole is going to go to the free agency. He's going to get paid a lot. Zach Granke, who they signed, is really not going to be a, a real two-starter. They still have Justin Verlander, who gets better as he ages. But still, you never know with guys this old in the MLB. And I think, I mean, if the Yankees make some moves, then this Astros team might have some problems, and you might not even see this team in the in the ALCS next year. So Bold they prediction there, Platt. Now, quick, guys, let's go around. Steven Strasburg did win the World Series <clears throat> MVP, excuse me. But do you guys think another person should have won MVP? No, I mean, he's a guy who's kind of been their rock for years now, and even without Harper there, I think he deserved it. You know, the pitching is something where you either have it or you don't. If you don't have a pitcher, you're not winning the World Series, and he's been there since day one, and he's done a terrific job. If they didn't have him as a foundational piece, I don't think they get it done. Platt? I'm going to disagree with that. Uh, I think Juan Soto, the guy who's just turned 21, unbelievable, saved them in the National League wild card game with that big hit in the eighth. Um, but no, I think he should have won it. I mean, the guy is so young, and he's so good from the left side of the plate I think he definitely should have won it but I mean Strasburg pitched really well definitely but my opinion was that Anthony Rendon should have won great great World Series for him lots of clutch home runs but speaking of Anthony Rendon he is a free agent and we're going to get into some free agents right now the top three in the MLB is Garrett Cole of course Anthony Rendon and Steven Strasburg three of them that just finished the World Series that's insane the World Series teams are losing their big players potentially and we're going to do a little bit of predictions here. So let's go around. Let's start with Cole from the Astros. Ian, where do you think he's going to end up? I think he's going to end up in L.A. with the Angels. Look, he's going to get big money. I mean, he might not have won the World Series, but he deserves every single penny that he's going to get. Still only 29 years old. They got Mike Trout. Not a lot more on that team. But you have Trout and Cole on the same team. The sky's the limit. And I think that would really put them back in the competition with L.A. I'm going to the other side of LA. I'm saying the Dodgers, a team that, I mean, really disappointed. People thought that, you know, third time's a charm for them. Lost to the Nationals. But uh, I think he's going to go to the Dodgers. I think they're due for a World Series a World Series win. And I think, yeah, he does. And he and Clayton Kershaw, boy, that could be a killer one too. Definitely. I think the Braves. You know, the Braves, they're gradually getting better. Very young team with Swanson and Albies and Acuna. But their pitching is a little bit shaky. You know, they have Fulton Evich, but we saw what happened with him in the playoffs. So I think they really need that number one starter, that veteran starter that's going to lock them down. And I think that Garrett Cole is that man. Now let's head over to the, to the hitters. Anthony Rendon, he turned down a seven-year, $210 million contract offer from the Nats midseason. You know he's going to get more than that in free agency. Where do you think he's going, Ian? Well, since their season ended so unexpectedly, he could return home. But I think, even though there's not a lot of connection here, I think the White Sox would be a really good fit. They have a lot of great young players. Tim Anderson, one of the better hitters in baseball, and a great pitcher already in Lucas Giolito. So I think you add Rendon there. Not the best hitter, but he really showed up in the World Series, and they have a lot of money to throw around. So I think the White Sox wouldn't be a bad location for him. 
Great. I think Austin? I think he stays in Washington personally. I mean, this, the National League uh, East is very competitive. I mean, some people say it's a four team race, but I mean, then there's the Mets. But uh, I think and the Marlins and, <laughs> and the Marlins <laughs> can't forget about them. But uh, I think he does stay in Washington. I mean, he just won a World Championship. The Nationals love him, and you expect them to lose Strasburg. So I think he will stay, and maybe you know, with Juan Soto getting a, a year older and another year of experience. Maybe this team can return back. Obviously, they didn't even win the division this year, so maybe they can do that if Rendon stays. I have a hot take for you guys. I'm going to say he's mm. going to go to the New York Mets, a oh. team that does not spend any money, of course. <laughs> uh, they've been crucified by that by their fans. But I think they're going to have a big change this offseason. Brody Van Wagenen, second year as being the acting general manager. New manager and Carlos Beltran, which we'll get into. But I really think this team, they just lost Todd Frazier at third base, and they really need like a lockdown third baseman to go along with Pete Alonso and Jeff McNeil, who's going to be the second baseman. They don't have to move him around anymore. So I think they really go out and make a big splash. As starting pitching isn't something they need, and they really need a lockdown third baseman. All right, wait, Dylan, I just want to jump in there. Do you think Beltron makes the Mets a more attractive option? What do you think he brings to the table there? I think he line? brings a more personal approach to the team. Uh, Mickey Calloway was a guy where the players were a bit scared of him. They didn't really have that communication that other teams have with uh, managers like Alex Cora or Aaron Boone with the Yankees. I think he's going to bring a more um, environment where the players can go in and talk to him, just like best buds. They can go in and just speak about what's going on, and they don't have to be scared of their manager. Uh, so let's go into our last free agent here. Steven Strasburg just came off an amazing World Series. Ian... Where is he going? Well, Austin, you said Rendon was going to stay. I think Strasburg is going to stay. There's really no reason for him to leave. Got drafted number one overall. He's done his due there. He's 30 years old. He's going to get a lot of money from them if they don't sign Rendon. I think easily he stays and uh, keeps hopefully getting them some more wins next year with or without Rendon. Makes sense. Austin? Uh, I think the Yankees finally make a splash here. Dylan, we've been waiting for a pitcher all all year long, and uh, I think Strasburg is the guy that the Yankees sign. I think uh, – Cole might get um, a little overpaid, but uh, Strasburg is the guy. Definitely after a World Series MVP, he's going to get paid the right amount. The Yankees need a solid right-handed starter. Obviously, Luis Severino injured. You don't know what he's going to bring back. So I think if you bring Strasburg to the Bronx, then, hey, 28 could be coming pretty soon. Definitely. I really think he's going to go to the Padres, another up-and-coming team that I'm going to talk about. You know, They just signed Machado last year. They have a few up-and-coming guys in Tatis, Chris Paddock, who uh, went off at the end of the season, but he was very good at the start. And they have a lockdown closer in Kirby Yates. So that's a team that I think needs a veteran starter. Come in, just give him seven innings every time, and they could he could uh, make a run at that wild card next year. Now, Platt, uh, as Yankee fans as we are, let's get into some Yankee news. So Didi Gregorius was not offered the qualifying offer of $17 million, which, mi- which means he's a free agent now. And where does he go from here, Austin? Um, well, I think the Yankees should should sign him. I mean, left hand. I mean, Yankee Stadium was built for his swing. Every home run he has hit in the Bronx has been out to right field or right center. So I think the Yankees do need him. Obviously, um, with Aaron Hicks injured, uh, you never know what Brett Gardner is going to bring back. You need some someone who's going to hit home runs in Yankee Stadium. I think the Yankees do need Didi back. Yeah, there is kind of it's a crowded infield. Obviously, Miguel Andujar. We don't know what he's going to bring. But you need someone who's going to hit home runs at Yankee Stadium. He had a down year. Obviously, he was injured at Tommy John surgery. But the Yankees need him back. I think he does come back. I strongly disagree with you, actually. I'm going to bring up a few points here. Dieter Gregorius batted 238. Now, yes, he is coming off Tommy John surgery, and you can make excuses. But excuses aren't made in the Bronx, okay? It's World Series or bust every single year for this team. And I cannot be watching Dieter Gregorius pop out every time to the third baseman. This is a team that depends on every single player in that lineup to produce. And if I have him producing against the Twins, maybe a little bit, but then here come the Astros and he's not doing anything, there's going to be a change. And I think he's actually, I'm going to make another free agent prediction, guys, if that's okay with you. No, probably running the show. He is going to go to the New York Mets, along with Rendon. That left side of the infield will be deadly, apparently, if Didi is what he is back in 2017 and 18. And I really think he goes to the Mets on a cheap, maybe one-year deal to prove himself, and then maybe he can get paid the next year. So, Austin, thank you for uh, stepping in as our baseball analyst. We're now going to bring in Chad Russo for some NFL and NBA talk. Thank you, Austin. And we are back. Beyond the Whistle, Episode 2. We have now brought in our NFL analyst, Chad Russo. Nice to see you, Chad. It's great to see you, Dylan. And may I say, you're looking very dapper today. Thank you, Chad. That's how you get on the host side. (laughs) Anyway, guys, we will now go on to some NFL talk. 
halfway through the season, about week nine just finished up. Week 10 started last night with the Chargers and the Raiders. The Raiders pulling that one out in the last few minutes. And we will now talk about the only undefeated team in the league, guys, the 49ers. So I have a quick question for you guys. When does this team finally lose? Well, I mean, this year they really haven't played too many terrific teams. They played some good teams. They played the Rams, and they also played the Seahawks, I think. Actually, no, they still have to play those two games. But regardless, their schedule coming up in the next five weeks is horrible. They play the Packers, they play the Ravens, they play the Saints, and they play the Seahawks on Monday night. And Russell Wilson in prime time, he's electric. So I think they lose to the Ravens in week 13 first. I think they can beat Aaron Rodgers. He's been up and down occasionally this year against good defenses. But Baltimore on the road, Lamar Jackson hot as ever. Give me that as the first week they lose. Chad? I mean, Ian, you just talked about how electric Russell Wilson is. And this year it's looking like he's going to be an MVP. So uh, I'm thinking they lose this week wow. against the Seahawks. Great one, Chad. I also agree with you. I mean, I really think that this team's going to show its true colors against a real top team like the Seahawks. They're very new. They're very, like, they, a lot of rookies on that team. Jimmy G, about, like, 15 games played. That's not that much. He doesn't have much experience. And I really think they go down this week. But it could be a learning experience for this team. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, you think. We always talk about Jimmy G and how, like, great he looks. He's only started 15 games, even though he's been in the league for, like, half a decade. So I think it's going <laughs> to be interesting. He's played behind Tom Brady, so he obviously boosts him up in his uh, football IQ. It's going to be interesting to see when they first lose. As you mentioned, great point, Dylan. It's going to show them their true colors. Like, how far can this team go this year against legit talent? I mean, I've, I heard a great thing about Jimmy Garoppolo recently, and it was from uh, their fullback, Kyle Juszczyk. Mm, the best in the uh, league. He was a Harvard guy, right? Yeah. He says <laughs> that Jimmy G is the best football mind he's ever been around. That says just something. crazy to think about when you think about all the crazy smart people at Harvard that – <laughs> Kyle Juszczyk would say that is the smartest football guy. He's and he's been a around. part of a Super Bowl winning team in the Baltimore Ravens, so mm -hmm. he knows how it is to win. So that's a very interesting point. Good point, Chad. Great points, boys. Now let's go to the next question here. The divisions have been up and down. If you look through the league, there's some divisions that are over, maybe like the AFC East and the Patriots, of course. But then there are some divisions that aren't over, and they could really have a great finish as the season comes down. So everyone here, I'm going to say, each of you, let's pick a division and let's go into it. What division do you guys think will have the best finish this year? All Chad? right, so I'm going to kick it off with the uh, AFC West. I'm a big Raiders guy. I'm pretty sure you all know. Really? And, uh, oh, yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. Usually I have on my Raiders hat, but... We, we got to uh, keep it professional here beyond the whistle. Of course, of course. Uh, so I see the Chiefs finishing 12-4 and four this year. I just don't think there's many teams in the league that can stop them. But the Raiders are the really interesting team in this division. They could finish this year around 10-6, and six, especially with that win last night, making them 5-4. and four. They have a pretty weak schedule coming up. They're going to play against the Bengals and the Jets for the next two games, which should be pretty easy wins. Those are two of the worst teams in the league. And then the Chargers are also very competitive this year. They have a shot at making the wild card game. They could finish 800 this year, 500 this year. All right, Chad. Ian? Well, I, I think that win last night for you guys really helps your case for that division because I'm really interested to see how John Gruden does. You know, they did they signed Gruden not to fix his team immediately. They did give him a 10-year deal for a reason. So last year, everyone's like, oh, they're crazy for giving him $100 million. But with not a lot of talent this year, he's done so much. So I love what they're doing over there in Oakland. I think the AFC South is going to be really interesting. The top, all these teams in the division have four wins or more. I think they're the most winningest division in football, the AFC South. Texans are 6-3. and three. I like this team a lot. They have a lot of holes, but they fill them up because it's Deshaun Watson and DeAndre Hopkins working magic. Watson is carrying this team just like he did last year. The question is, is how long can he do it? They have a tough schedule coming up. In the next few weeks, they play the Ravens, the Colts, and the Patriots. That's a big test. Could they fall to five losses, six losses soon? Who knows? We're going to see the true colors of that team. Indianapolis, Jacoby Brissett might be out this week, but I like this team a lot. You know, they have a lot of good veteran players, and they have one of the best coaches in football in Frank Wright, and they're undefeated in the division right now. Jacksonville, Nick Foles, I don't think they're out of it yet. Look, a lot of people are like, why was Gardner Minshew benched? He was ben Gardner Minshew benched. He was benched because he lost against some good teams and he beat some bad teams. He's a great young player, great young mustache, and hopefully he'll start in the future. But this is why you bring Nick Foles in. Over the last two years, he's literally brought the Eagles in. Or last year, he literally brought a struggling Eagles team into the playoffs with a great late run. And there's a lot of talent there in Jacksonville, especially on defense. 
So I think watch out for them. They could finish with nine or ten wins. And Tennessee's kind of out of it, but you never know. I like the coaching staff. Tannehill, he's had experience. I think they're out of it. But those three teams, I think any of them could win the division and or get a wild card spot. I mean, that AFC South division is always close. I mean, last year we had that Week 17 winner-go-home game yep. between the Colts and the and the, um, the Titans. Yep. Right? So, like, every, every year it's always close. There's not a team in that division that really takes over every year, like, let's say, the Patriots in the AFC East. My division that I think is going to finish the best is the NFC North. There's three teams in that division that I feel are top-of-the-line teams, excluding the Bears because I really give up on the Bears this year. <laughs> they're, they're not a team that um, I feel can make a run. But the Vikings, the Packers, and the Lions, all teams that I feel are very undervalued in the a- a- NFC, a crowded NFC at, at that. And the Vikings, you know, they show up on some weeks. They don't at some. But they have a huge game this week against the Cowboys, primetime Sunday night football. And I feel that their defense really needs to step up and show maybe what the Bears did last year, where their defense can win games if a Kirk Cousins is struggling, which we've seen he does at big games. Uh, Another team, the Packers, you know the Packers, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones. The defense is somewhat getting better, but they did have a step back against the Chargers last week. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do believe in this team can, I mean, they have a great record right now at 7-2. They're going to have a bye week coming up, and then they're going to be back. Aaron Rodgers, full health. You can't bet against that guy. And then the Lions, a team that I'm going to talk about a bit later as well. The Lions have kept every game close. Their offense is amazing. They score about 26 points per game. And Matt Stafford is real. I feel like he's very underrated. I mean, he puts up points. The defense, the defense is, you know, it struggled this year. And that's going to happen with the Lions. They never really have a lockdown defense. But if their offense can keep it rolling, they could definitely beat some teams and sneak into a wild card spot. All right, guys, let's go to the last question here for football. As I was talking about the Lions, uh, let's touch, let's give um, one team, or actually let's give two teams, one from each conference that isn't in a playoff spot now, but you feel will be at the end of the season. Uh, I gotta say, for the NFC Rams, it's kind of crazy. You think they have to be in the playoff spot? Not really. They're behind the 49ers, and they're also behind uh, Seattle right now. Mm-hmm. It's a really we had, we didn't even touch on that division. The NFC uh, West is super competitive right now, and I think Jalen Ramsey changes the game. Uh, he'll have his bumps here and there. It hasn't been a great year for him, but he's a menace. People won't throw to him. He makes that defense instantly better. Wade Phillips will know how to use him. And this is, I mean, this offense, this is a Super Bowl team. Super Bowl runner up that gets no respect. So what? It was a young team that got clapped by the Patriots in a Super Bowl. This is a great team, great young coach, and I think he will find a way. He's a great football mind to get this team back in it. What are they, five and three right now? They still have a great record. They can obviously make a wild card spot at the least. And then there's Pittsburgh in the AFC. A little bit of a gamble. I don't love Mason Rudolph. He has talent, great player, I think, for the future and in the long run. But as, uh, he's not really that great yet. But they're on a winning streak because of his defense. Minka Fitzpatrick was a terrific trade. I didn't love it at first. He's been a game wrecker. He's had like mm-hmm. a couple of picks, including that pick six last week. I really loved him. TJ Watt, Cameron Hayward. And then offense, if Juju can get in a groove, James Conner can get fully healthy. They have the weapons and a terrific O-line to make a run and win nine or ten games. Definitely. I mean, you can't ever count the Steelers out. They changed their mindset from winning offenses, winning games offensively mm-hmm. with Ben Roethlisberger, and now they really transitioned with that trade with Fitzpatrick mm-hmm. to win games defensively, which has worked at times this year. Now, Chad, give me your two teams. So I chose the other team out of Pennsylvania. I chose the Eagles to be a surprise uh, playoff pick for the NFC. I think they have one of the best front sevens in football with Fletcher Cox on the D-line. They have some good draft picks in there. There's Brandon Graham on the outside playing linebacker. I think that front seven's really strong, and they really need to work on the uh, the really weak secondary. Yeah. That's been one of the like really big surprises this year. The they had secondary. some injuries. Oh, yeah. Well, like the secondary this year, when I see them in fantasy, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm playing that <laughs> player against them. So uh, if they can work on the secondary, like their offenses should be one of the better ones in the NFL. You have Alshon Jeffrey. You have Miles Sanders, you have Jordan Howard, you have Carson Wentz, who was almost an MVP candidate two years ago. Mm -hmm. So you have a solid offense. It's just that weak secondary has really been bringing them down. And then for my team out of the AFC, it's a little bit of a shock coming from a Raiders fan. (laughs) But it's the Chargers. Okay. I mean, they were initially favored coming into the season to make a a really big push for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be them and the Chiefs competing for the division. I still think their team has some of that talent, especially with Nick Bosa. He's having around a defensive player of the year kind of year. Mm-hmm. It's just because of the Patriots that he might not win it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
And then there's also Melvin Gordon, who they had to have holdouts with all season, who's kind of he's shaping up to be a stud this year. He had a great game against the Raiders, and if he can keep that going, I think they could really make a push. I mean, definitely. We never, we always really count out Phillip Rivers in big games because that like weird arm motion he has, a good sidearm, not in a good way, like Patrick Mahomes. But, yeah, no. <laughs> um, he sometimes crumbles under under pressure. We saw it last night with the Raiders. And the defense has been great. They had a huge win against the Packers, but they did have a step back last night against the Raiders, which is a tough game on the road, of course. But um, if they could turn around, they could definitely make a playoff spot. I think the one thing that could turn them around, you got to respect the coaching staff. That's one thing. You talk about, you know, how can you keep a locker room together? Anthony Lynn is a terrific coach who doesn't get enough credit. Double-digit wins for a team that never gets double-digit wins over the last two years. Ken Wisenhunt and Gus Bradley, you never talk about coordinators. Both these guys have... Head coaching experience. Wizen Hunt was a Super Bowl guy. Oh, wait, they just fired him. Well, he was with the Titans, Ian. He was with the Titans, but they actually they fired Wizen Hunt a few weeks ago. But the point, <laughs> the point is, is they have a great young coach, a great veteran coaching staff, I should say. And actually, you know, with that win last night, I know I'm going to boost your Raiders' ego here. I think you should probably flip the Raiders in the vet spot because the Raiders, I think, are shaping up to be a playoff team right now. It's scary to play. Well, Ian, you took my pick, Ian. Took it right out of my mouth. I, I'm, no, it's more of a segue. Okay, segue. That's how you do it. You know, the Raiders are one of my teams, my AFC team that I feel is going to make the playoffs. They have a very uh, easy schedule, as you talked about. Not only playing the uh, Bengals and the Jets, but also they have a few other wins that I feel that they could have. The Titans, very weak team. Jacksonville, I feel like they can beat with that defense. Uh, we had a huge game from Max Crosby last night, who I just met on Hard Knocks this year. Mm. Great guy, and now he's uh, rushing um, for the Raiders. And they could also beat Denver, and I wrote down only one game they had to win versus the Chargers, but they did that last night, Dang. and now they have a chance to win again whenever they play them next. And that's 10-6 and six in an, a crowded AFC. Uh, you see the Bills in the wild card position and a few other teams, but I feel like they're a very... Um, you know, possible team to make that make the playoffs in the wild card spot. My NFC team is the Lions, as I talked about, guys. They're three, four, and one. Not the best record. They've had some tough, close games. You know, with the Cardinals, with the with the uh, Raiders a few weeks ago, where they lost in the goal line. Tough, tough loss. But they're very competitive, and they're not a team that gets blown out. They drop a lot of points every game. I feel is a shootout. They had a shootout against the Chiefs earlier this year, where they lost in a last minute drive by Patrick Mahomes. What are you gonna do about that? But let me go through their wins as well. Uh, I feel like they can beat the Bears twice. The Bears are a very down, down the dumps team. That team is it's just, they have a lot of issues right now. Uh, they could beat the Redskins, of course, Tampa, Denver. And I feel like they could beat one game against um, the Packers. You know, the Packers, they've had their set up setbacks with the Chargers. Um, and we'll see how they bounce back after the bye week. But if the Lions, they could just drop points and hopefully their defense get a few stops. They could show up, and that's a 9-6-1 record in an NFC that everyone's battling for the spots. Uh, so that's a, that's a great segment, guys. Um, now we're going to head over from the gridiron to the NBA basketball court. Um, that was great NFL talk, but let's start with the NBA. It just started up, and let's, let's drop some predictions on, the, on these, uh, this audience. So, Ian, we're going to go back to the shocked question. Give me an East team and a West team that shocked you so far. Well, I'm going to take kind of a freebies because these teams were literally two teams that everyone thought would be god-awful this year, and they've been anything but. Charlotte in the East has been extremely interesting because we thought this might be one of the worst teams really ever assembled on a court with Terry Rozier being their best player. Terry Rozier's look good. He's getting Michael Jordan out of the seat with that step-back three. This team's got buzz. They've got a head coach, James Borrego, who used to be a Spurs assistant, and when you play under Greg Popovich, you're bound to be a good veteran coach. And P.J. Washington, a guy coming out of Kentucky who was hurt in March Madness, lost a lot of hype, but he's been an extremely efficient, really good young scorer. They also got Miles Bridges, who's an athletic dunking kind of guy at the rim this is a lot of talented team they're four and three i don't know if they can keep it up but the future looks a lot brighter in charlotte than it did a few weeks ago before the season started and then phoenix has been absolutely amazing i don't have their schedule on me right now but they beat the warriors they beat uh another tie i'm pretty sure they beat the 76ers yes. and their only two losses this year have been like a combined three-point margin and they have they played some of the top teams they're in the western conference you know, if they were in the East right now, they might be undefeated. It's crazy that they're like the second or third seed in the West right now. Devin Booker, you always wonder, is he a good player on a bad team or is he a legit superstar? He's proving himself right now. Um, Monty Williams, who came over from Philly, a former great player, one of the better assistants in the league. 
he is instantly your coach of the year candidate for this team. It doesn't have a lot. DeAndre Ayton suspended for 25 games. So can they keep it up with that? Their big man in the lineup. Who knows? But I love this team right now. It's cra- I mean, this was like the Cleveland Browns team of the NBA for years. And all of a sudden, you know, Cleveland Browns didn't live up to the hype this year. Phoenix had no hype, and they are doing phenomenal right now. Got to love it. Chad? All right. So my pick's going to be a, a little questionable for the uh Lay it on us, Chad. Go nuts. I chose the Clippers as my surprise team for surprise the year. Surprise team. A negative surprise Ta-da. for me. Oh, so they have, a record, okay. they have a record of 5-3 and three right now. So a really good record. But when you look at this team's roster, they had the potential to beat the Warriors record, I thought, going into this season. Interesting. I thought they had, with the potential, with Montrez Harrell, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and Lou Williams coming off the bench to really put together a really strong season. And dropping three games this early in the season, especially when you're resting guys like Kawhi, when it's it's no you're not far enough into the year to be resting people. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest. We'll get into that a bit later, Chad. But yeah, so <laughs> I think that team definitely a negative surprise for me thus far. But I think they're still going to be huge contenders in the West. That's that's undoubtable. And then for another positive surprise for this year for me, it would be the Celtics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you came into this year, I was like, ah, they don't really have a star. Like, they don't have someone they could truly build around. But uh, Kimball Walker's really emerged as a, uh, a star for their team. And they also have six guys stub- scoring in double digits so far this year, which is usually a recipe for success in the league. If you can have guys coming off the bench that can score and a solid lineup that you're scared of, every player you have to be worried about and they can space the floor – they can really go on to have a great season this year. Mm -hmm. And especially, sorry to cut you off there, Dylan, Gordon Hayward is a guy who everyone forgot about after that gnarly ankle injury. And he had a bad year last year. He was rushed back into action when he shouldn't have been. And he didn't look good. And he just tied a few nights ago up against the Cavaliers. But 39 points, his career high. So if they can get him and uh, Kemba Walker, one-two punch, great head coach, great uh, front office, this is a team that could easily be at the top of the East. You know, they lost some hype after last year. I think they can get it right back this year. I mean, we always expect Boston sports teams to do well, and to no surprise, they're doing well again. Uh, let's go to my teams here. Let's start with the East. Miami Heat is a team that surprised me, the team that just came out of the came out of the dumps, just showed up. I mean, I didn't really think that Jimmy Butler, a guy who plays with a lot of emotion, some has been have questioned him for his chemistry with his teammates, and he's really gelled well with, you know, uh, Goran Dragic and Tyler Hero out of Kentucky, a guy who... He's hit so many clutch free throws in that March Madness. I feel like I watched that on repeat. Um, just a clutch player, point guard, sets that offense up along with Drogic. And another guy, a standout sophomore undrafted um, player in Duncan Robinson. You know, I want to touch on him. He dropped 22 points against the Rockets on Sunday, and he's a big man who could really set the, set the tone for this uh, Miami Heat team along with Bam Adebayo. And just a team, like you said, a lot of stars, and they're combining to just have a great chemistry and a team that anyone can soar. It's not like one player scoring the whole game, right, Chad? And this is, yeah, this is your team, Chad, so you've probably watched more games than us. What do you see? How has Eric Spolcha put this team together so quickly? So I just wanted to take the second to talk about another really big stud for them this year, which would have to be Kendrick Nunn. He was an undrafted guy coming out of Oakland. No one really saw much potential in him, but Eric Spolcher took the, kind of went out on a limb and signed him. And this year, he's the third highest scoring rookie this, out of all rookies this year. So out of all those lottery picks, out of everyone drafted, he's the third highest scoring rookie, which I just think is when you can get a guy like that for so cheap, that's, that's really going to build up your team. You can have him coming off the bench, providing a little bit of scoring, and that's just key for guys. Definitely, Chad. And I'm going to go to my West team here, the Mavericks. Uh, we see Luka Doncic and Kendrick, uh, not Kendrick Perving, um, Kristaps Porzingis. I get the KP messed up, guys. Um, so the Mavericks, you know, they're in a tough Western Conference, but they're showing up every every game, and they're putting up a fight. Um, they had a tough loss to Lakers uh, a few games ago with that uh, three at the buzzer regulation by Danny Green and then losing in overtime. It's a younger team, but I really feel like they have a lot of potential. They could make some noise in the playoffs this year. Um, so let's go to a team that you simply – don't think we'll go as far as you think. And let's go a little rapid fire here, Ian. All right, I'm going to go Portland. I love Portland. I love Terry Scott. you got to love Dame Lillard and C.J. McCollum. But it's a loaded West. This team is not deep enough in my mind. Just looking at it right now, especially if Phoenix can keep what they're doing up, I don't know how far they go. Chad? 
Uh, I have to say the Brooklyn Nets. I just don't think Kyrie Irving can carry a team that far in the playoffs. I, he's a great player, don't get me wrong, but I just don't think there's enough around him to be able to make a true run in the playoffs in a in a division where there's the 76ers, the Bucks, and the Celtics. Speaking of 76ers, that's my team. I don't feel like they can go as far, um, and that's not judging their talent. They have a lot of talent, a lot of great players, but I really feel like their, um, their star in Joel Embiid, he's a player that I, I wouldn't want on my team. He causes too much drama. He's fighting players like Carl Anthony Towns. He's going on social media, making us a big mess. That's not a player that I want on my team playing every game. And, you know, they have Al Horford, who I feel should be, um, you know, kind of like mentoring him and just saying, you can't do this type of stuff. you got to keep to yourself. He's in his third, fourth year in the league. He's not a veteran. He hasn't won anything yet. I mean, he has to just keep his mouth shut and get better. I mean, he's been injury plagued and... I feel he's, you know, feel he's in a position to go on social media and calling other players, you know, foul language terms. Um, now, quickly, let's do a quick, way, way too early NBA Finals prediction. Once again, Ian, start us off. Well, Dylan, thanks for, um, for uh, trashing the 76ers. But when you talk about the talent on this team, it's undeniable. Brett Brown, I don't love him as a coach, so I don't know how far they do, though, do go. But I'm going to go Philly Nuggets right now. Interesting. And here's why. I love the Eastern Conference, it can go a lot of different ways. It can go Milwaukee. It can go them. It can go Boston. We don't really know. But when we talk about a talent standpoint, especially if Ben Simmons can shoot a three once every couple of games or at least once a game, have defenses respect that. That is the key. If he starts shooting just a little bit, this game opens up for Philly. Joel Embiid, Josh Richardson, Al Horford. This is the best starting five in the NBA, in my opinion. Brett Brown, he's shown flashes. Can he put it together and bring this team to greatness? And Nuggets are the deepest team in the league. And we haven't even seen Michael Porter Jr. play that much yet. These Nuggets fans love him. He hasn't played enough. This is a deep team. You know, <laughs> Nikola Jokic might not look like a superstar player, but he is. He's a revolutionary big man who can do it all. And I like their coach, uh, Coach Malone. I think this that could be a really interesting finals matchup. Nuggets Philly is for me. Chad? Yeah, like you, Ian, I also trust the process. I think the 76ers... You guys are insane. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I think the 76ers are going to be the team to come out of yeah. the East. I think Joel Embiid's the best center in the entire NBA. I think he is more than right to be able to talk on social media. And uh, my team out of the West is definitely has to be the Clippers. I mean, you got Paul George, you got Kawhi Leonard. There's not much else that needs to be said. So you feel like they do turn it around after a slower start? Of course, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, doing, they're resting Kawhi eight games into the year. That shows just how good they are. But they don't really care about winning right now. They just care about making it to the playoffs healthy. And guys, I just want to touch on the load management debate that everyone's been having. I feel, um, I'm not trying to be a boomer here or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, why are you, it's eight games in the season and you're resting players like... In other sports, we don't really see this. Well, football is a different story where it's every week you play a game. But baseball, we don't see players resting. Hockey, a player would never take a game off. I mean, why is it in basketball where a player, he plays about 38 minutes for a star every game, I would say, and they're resting? Like, it's not, sometimes it's not even back-to-back -back nights. I feel like there's an issue for the NBA. And, I mean, let's say some 12-year-old kid goes to a Charlotte Hornets game <laughs> and sees them play the Clippers. And he wants to see his favorite player, Kawhi Leonard, but he's sitting out because he played two nights ago in Houston. I feel like this is just an issue for the NBA, and they need to clean this up. Is it great for the NBA? No. Is it great for the fans? No. Is it good for the Clippers? Of course it is. If It doesn't matter what seed this team finishes with. When they get to the playoffs, they're going to be the best team in the West. There's only one goal in mind this year. This team went from a, hey, this is a nice up-and-coming team, to boom, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Doc Rivers is there. Championship or bust is what their goal is this year. That's why they're resting Kawhi. Is it the right move? Probably not, but it's a smart move when you look at it. Yeah, I just hate the resting of the players, to be completely honest. Like, imagine if someone were to do that in football. Imagine if a quarterback had to travel. He's <laughs> just like, week. I'm going to take a game off. Like, Come you on. Know, you know what? I just don't feel like throwing the ball today, coach. <laughs> like, imagine if a player went up and did that in the NFL. You'd probably get released or traded. So, like, looking at that in the NBA, the way they rest the players, especially considering it is a long season. I get that. That's definitely a part of it. But, like, even in the MLB, you said, that's a long season, too. 162 games. And they rarely rest their players. Rarely. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're starting pitchers that rotate through. But that's, that's the a The everyday players, story. they're playing 150 games a year. Exactly. I mean, that's crazy. Um, quick final position. P prediction from me, pardon guys, uh, but I have the Clippers and the Bucks. 
uh, two teams that I feel are just top of the line. I don't really see any surprises in the playoffs happening. They're going to be, well, maybe with the wrestling, they won't be the one seed, the Clippers. But I feel the Bucks will with Giannis and Chris Middleton. Great players. Um, so that's my prediction. Uh, that's all the time we have, guys. Thank you so much for coming on and giving us your hard-hitting analysis. And for Austin Platt. And for Austin earlier. for his MLB um, anal analyst, of course. Uh, that's it for us. Episode to be on the whistle. Thank you all. All right, peace. Thanks, it's on the feet.